Well, hello everyone. Kunis Ata Tu, Jamie is Adam Dum, and I'm the lead pastor of Lighthouse Church, and I'm so glad that you are able to join us today from wherever you are watching, whether it's a living room, a kitchen, maybe you're uh, in work or on your way to work or leaving work, wherever you're watching from, I just want to say a massive uh, Kemi LaFault, you're so glad uh, that you are with us today because we are starting a brand new series, everyone, called Love, Dates, and Heartbreaks. We figure that there's not a lot that we can talk about as a church uh, in this COVID-19 reality, with all the restrictions and restraints and all the uh, social isolation. But one thing that I know is affecting every single one of us, even though we don't, our, our contact with other people is limited, is the area of relationships. Because either you're a son, you're a daughter, you're a brother, you're a sister, you're a father, you're a mother, you're a grandfather or a grandmother. Maybe you're someone who was in a relationship, someone who's, someone who's moving towards a relationship, someone who's, who's uh, wanting to be in a relationship. Wherever you're at, I just want to say that uh, over the next few weeks, I really believe that God is going to say some things to us that will, yes, challenge us, but also encourage us, yes, stretch us, but ultimately, I believe, prove to be a strong foundation on which we can build healthy, long-lasting, fruitful relationships. This is a series that is for single people who are looking to be in a relationship. This is a series for students who right now are blowing up um, their parents' uh, internet bill and phone bill, uh, sending text messages to that BFF, that GF or BF. Um, this is a series for those people who are thinking about marriage, those who are engaged, those who are married, those who were married, those who are remarried, those who are kind of thinking of putting themselves out there once again into the whole dating world. And, you know, I understand, as you do too, it's, it's complex, it's changed, it's dangerous. This is a series for every one of us on the relational spectrum. And I know that what, what's, what's at the heart of all this is the idea that when we uh, uh, love someone, when we allow ourselves to love someone, there is the danger of heartbreak. And I want to address that too as the series on Foes. But let me kick off by sharing something with you that breaks my heart. Something that breaks my heart is watching people make relationship decisions that undermine their relationships. I mean, it just breaks my heart to see people, you know, adopt attitudes, <laughs> make choices, um, make decisions that rather than working for their relationship is actually working against their relationship. It isn't just me. You've seen it too. You have that friend, that brother, that, that sister, that colleague. Um, we've seen it in TV shows, we see it portrayed in movies where you, you look at them and you look at the decisions they're making and you ask yourself, have they not thought this through? I mean, have you not thought it through? I mean, have you put no thinking into this? I mean, um, what you're doing is not going to what you're doing is not going to help you achieve the goal that you say you want to get to. Or maybe um, you've watched someone you you kind of thought, have you seen that work out for anybody else? I mean, I know it works out in Netflix. I know in all the Disney movies and Hollywood movies and all the romance movies. You know, there's an hour and forty five minutes of these two people who seem to be magnetically connected almost from birth, and it's kind of like they're almost together and they're not. And then there's usually a third character and there's this weird love triangle going on, which I hate. And and it's all this mushy complex. And the very end, somehow they get together. And then the movie ends and we were supposed to believe they live happily ever after. It's funny how there's that nearly all Hollywood movies are devoted to how people fall in love. But there's almost no movies to portray how you stay in love. And so we all have seen people. We ask the question, have you ever actually in real life with real people seen that work out? Or has no one warned you? I mean, has no one ever warned you that the way you're going, the path you're taking the choices you're making won't work for you, but they will work against you. I'm also excited to, be able to talk to another group of people uh, through this series uh, because another thing that breaks my heart are people who get into relationships for the wrong reasons. I see this as a growing trend, especially amongst our young people. I'm really hoping and praying if you're uh, with me today and you're uh, here with us uh, in this online stream and you're someone who's young or maybe in college or maybe in secondary school, or maybe graduated college and just entering uh, the professional field, there's kind of like a, distor a, a, a distortion when it comes to the motive for relationships. I call it the beneficiary versus benefactor uh, issue. And that is that there's so many, there's too many people who are getting into relationships for what they can get out of it rather than 
going into relationships to see what they can add to it. I mean, there's a difference between usership and relationship. And the way culture's working movies and, uh, you know, online temptation and all these things, the portrayal of relationships and sexuality is pushing more and more young people to believe that the key to having a good relationship is to get what I want, to get what, what's good for me. If it's not good for me, then he or she is not good for me. And in actual fact, what we see at the basis of all healthy relationships, it's not a, a, a take, 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 not even just a give, 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 but it's a give and take. And when, and, and I'm speaking to you right now, if you're that kind of person and you're thinking, well, it's none of my business, you're right, it is none of my business, but it breaks my heart because I care for you and I love you and I want your, your relationships and I want your life by default to succeed. And when we get into relationships uh, seeking to be a beneficiary and not a benefactor, that always leads to misery. That always leads to misery because not only are, are we going to end up getting broken ourselves, but we are breaking other people. In other words, not only are we hurting you, but you are hurting others too. And this is really, really important. Why? Because uh, the hurt that we cause in people's lives, the hurt that we cause in our own lives, very often is a type of hurt that will stay with us for a very, very long time. And really what I'm saying in this, what I'm saying in this series, is that my desire for us, my desire for you and for me and for all of us right now engaged, is I don't want you, I don't want us to be a liar for life. What do I mean when I say a liar for life? Well, eventually we have to tell our story, right? Eventually someone's going to ask us, maybe even your own kids, are one day going to ask you about your teenage years, about your college years, about your early years and the choices, decisions and the relationships that you have had. I've had many instances in my home where my boys have asked me, especially my oldest, he's quite inquisitive and very intelligent. He's asked me about my life before Christ, asking very specific questions, trying to find out what kind of guy was I before Jesus. And of course, I was like everyone before Jesus. Uh, I was more messed up than I am now. I was more broken than I am now. And I, and I was desperately lost in my sin, selfish and driven to, to feed the needs that were in my soul because deep, deep down in me, there was a hunger for I thought would come through other means, but can only come and be satisfied by Jesus. And so if we don't pay attention to the narrative that we are creating every day with our choices, then one day as we get older, we're going to have to start um, how would you describe it? Um, tilting or shifting or tainting the truth to make ourselves look better than we are. And I want you to be the kind of people that when, 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 when you look back in years to come and you're walking through <coughs> super value and you see your ex, you don't turn to your current partner and go quickly, let's run to the pet food aisle to which they go, we ain't got no pets. Why are we in the pet food aisle? Because you are terrified by the possibility of having to confront a lie that you have told your spouse about a relationship that you were in in the past. To, to avoid the trap of being a liar for life, we've got to make some truthful decisions now in the present tense. Why? Because as a pastor, I've counseled literally dozens of couples, dozens of individuals, married people, um, pre-marriage counseling, crisis counseling, help you know, people navigate the falling apart and disintegration marriage. I mean, I've, I've seen it all. And one of the most heartbreaking things to me as a pastor is when I sit, particularly with, with the gals, seems to be more of a, of a girl thing. And what I find is that too many people, too many men told the truth too late. It's almost as if there was a verse of the truth or a half truth they were told because, again, uh, they were, were trying to re-envision the past. But eventually, the truth catches up to us and that can be devastating for a relationship. It's so important that as married couples that we are truthful to each other. It's so important now if you're on the journey to becoming or you desire to be in a marriage type relationship that we don't fall into the trap of telling the truth too late. Why? Because that always leads to regret and nothing Nothing is as dangerous to a relationship as that regret that can come from knowing that you have been lied to. This is why this is important. Why? Because number one, guys, I don't want you to be a hypocrite. I'm speaking to the guys now, to the men, come on. I don't want you to be, I don't want you to be that guy that is constantly having to remember your story. It's the way to remember how you told it last time because you know it's not true. You know you're not telling the truth and you got to keep your so-called facts in line so that you're not found out. I don't want you to live your life. I don't, I don't think it's good for you. I don't think it's good for the relationships you will be in. But here's the challenge. You got to think about 
who you are now because who you are now is who you'll have to remember in the days, weeks, months, and years to come. And the truth is this, speaking to guys specifically, if someone did unto your sister, come on, your daughter, your single mom, if someone did unto your significant other as you do unto other girls, you would want to blank unto them. If someone did the kind of thing, someone said the kind of things, if someone pressured, okay, the people, the, 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 the girls, women in your life that matter to you in the way that you do to other girls, you would want to do some pretty significant things on to them. I want to challenge you guys. Don't live a double life. Don't have a double standard. Don't be a hypocrite. Literally, the word hypocrite comes from the Greek language. It was a theatrical term where an actor would come on the platform, the stage, he'd have a certain mask, he would portray a certain character, win over the crowd, run backstage, come out with another mask and be a totally different person. There's a lack of congruence in that. And of course, it's very hard to trust the person when you don't know who the person is. So if, you, if we want to build long relationships that are healthy and vibrant, then we as guys need to be people, we be men that are committed to integrity, that have character, that get back to the good old days of just chivalry. And, we're, and these things matter to us, so we're not hypocritical. To the gals, I want to say this, don't be a commodity. Don't be a commodity. Again, let me talk to the women for just a moment. And again, I always feel uncomfortable talking to the women because I've never been a woman. And uh, I don't really know what, what being a woman's like. Uh, other than I, I thank God for women because I have lots of um, women that I love in my life, my, my wife, my mother, and so on and so forth. Mother-in-law, of course, in case you're watching, love you too. But, um, but what, what, I, what what's a commodity? A commodity is something that is bought and used and then eventually... I'm thrown away. I want to. I want to challenge you, ladies. Don't be a commodity. I know there's certain cases where you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, violence can be an issue, and women have no choice. And you know, we want to pray for those people today, and we want to help those people. If you're a person right now that's stuck in that kind of abusive relationship, please, please, please contact us. Simply go to lighthousechurch.ie and right there on the landing page, click next step, and we would love to help you. But the truth is. As, as challenging as that story is, that's not the, the main story. The vast majority of women are not in that position. And what happens is, is that women very often allow themselves to become a commodity. In other words, it's your decision. Again, speaking to young girls, it's your decision, okay? Because if the only way you can have that relationship with him is by giving up who you are, by allowing him to push you past your boundaries, by giving in to his demands, it's not really a relationship. And rather than being a significant, or rather, rather than being a partner, you're becoming a commodity. I want to challenge you guys, don't be a hypocrite. I want to challenge you guys, girls, gals, don't allow yourself to be a commodity. Now, there's kind of two um, pervasive myths, okay? There's a cultural mythology that surrounds relationship. And again, it's important to note that we have a, a cultural moment that we're living right now. I know that our world seems like the world, and it seems like the world was always this way. And we look back at history and we, we kind of superimpose our cultural moment onto past cultural moments uh, as if people in a certain time should have had the same values, understanding that we have. But the truth is they didn't because they didn't have the values and opportunities we have. That's only true now in, in terms of time, but it's true in terms of culture. There's parts of our world that, that uh, just kind of understand or see the world the way that we do. But nonetheless, in this Western world, mostly driven by media and music and film, we have a, a cultural mythology, a kind of a cultural paradigm perspective on how relationships should work. And there's two kind of key myths that drive and underline um, this kind of relationship dysfunction. Myth number one, just to give it to you, and again, it's probably quite obvious, and you're probably, you're probably all thinking, uh, you're pushing back a bit going, well, what's, what's the issue here? The first myth that we see culturally is what I'm going to call the right person myth. The right person myth. Again, we see this portrayed in movie and film all the time. What is the right person myth? The right person myth basically says, once I meet the right person, everything will be all right. Once I find the right person, everything will be all right. In other words, the key to happiness, the key to a successful relationship, it isn't work, it isn't sacrifice, it isn't character. The key to having a right relationship 
is finding the right person. And one day we'll just magically find them. And you know, uh, you gals, you'll be in a tower somewhere singing a, a song, a melody, and Prince Charming in the forest will hear your beautiful voice and come galloping to your rescue. And then you'll live happily ever after, right? To which all the married people say, <clears throat> that's not true. It, it takes a little bit more just finding the right person for everything to be all right. What we see in, in our own experience and what we see in experience of others in, in a dysfunctional sense is that very often people who fall into this trap find the right person, right? They take the selfies, their social media is plastered with photos and they love each other and there's text messages, come on. And girls have a box with like, you know, um, let, love letters that he wrote to you and, and petals from flowers he gave to you. And this, the, this, if, you're, if you're my generation, the CD of the songs, come on, you know, you know you have that box, tell the truth. You're asking how I know. Well, it's because this is so, so, so predictable, okay? And then what happens is a period of time goes by, maybe you end up getting married. And then all of a sudden, things start to be not all right. Things start to go wrong. Things start to break down. And your relationship is challenging. And love is no longer in the air. And, you know, Rapunzel is no longer a princess in the tower singing her song. She's more like Cinderella mopping the floor after her five kids have come through the kitchen again from playing outside. And uh, Prince Charming is more like um, an ogre, uh, like Shrek, uh, burping and farting, drinking his drink, watching his sports. And you think, what has gone wrong and all of a sudden it dawns on you that what's gone wrong is th th this 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 principle is still true right because you see it in the movies and the magazines and culture so what's gone wrong is is you must have chosen the wrong right person right you must have chosen i mean it, of all the right people out there you chose the wrong right person so you're you begin, you get to think okay well then how do i get out of this trap how do i get back into love how do i get back to that place well it's going to move on to the next right person if i can just get the next right person then everything will be okay the underlying driver for this is that once you find them everything <clears throat> will be fine once you find them everything will be fine. We see this time and time and time again portrayed in Netflix and Hollywood movies and novels and romance uh, literature and all those things. Let me tell you something. There is, there is more, there is more to a satisfying relationship than finding are being found. There is more to a satisfying relationship than finding are being found. This, 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 uh, what would you call it? This cultural paradigm infects our decisions and fuels our fantasies. It infects the choice that we make because we don't choose people if we want to be in a relationship with them, not based on their character or their track record or, or their value system. We choose people based on how they fit into the cultural paradigm of being Prince Charming. In other words, girls, you're more interested in what, what cologne he wears and what his hair looks like than his track record with, te with treating girls. Or guys, you're more interested with how short her skirt is or how much cleavage she's willing to show you than her track record of commitment in past relationships. It completely affects our decision process, which is crazy. I mean, has no one warned you? Where have you seen this work out before? But it also fuels our fantasies. Why? Because we dream, we long, we hope. It doesn't matter if you're married or unmarried or remarried. We fall into this fantasy of one day if this prince child will just come and whisk me away everything will be uh, all right. Our culture is fixated on finding the right person rather than being the right person. Our culture, our culture is fixated on finding the right person. But at the same time, our culture is punctuated by dysfunctional relations. All the Hollywood stars and people that we look up to, the vast majority of them are themselves broken are broken hearted or have, 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 have had many broken relations. Why? Because they're all fixated on finding the right person when no one's having the conversation. What does it look like and why is it important to be the right person? So myth number one is the right person myth. Myth number two then, the second kind of driving pervasive myth is the promise myth. And again, you've seen this worked out time and time again. What is the promise myth? The promise myth says that a promise replaces the need for preparation. A promise, 
All you need is a kiss and a promise, right? All you need is a promise. Promise me it's going to be okay, and then it'll just magically be okay. Myself and my wife, Lamila, we're watching a TV series right now, and I'm not a TV series guy because I kind of watch an episode and then can't stop watching them, which is very annoying to me. Um, so either if I'm going to watch a series, I like to watch them as they're being released so you can watch an episode and wait a week, okay? But often I like watching movies because it, it starts, it ends, you're done. <clears throat> but watching this series, and we're on like season six right now, and I can't tell you how many times in this series the two main characters have lied to each other about the nature of what's going on in the relationship and simply said, say, say to each other at different times, I promise you it's going to be okay. And then, of course, what happens next is the episode unfolds is it's not okay. It's definitely not okay. And not only have we, have we seen this on TV, too often we've suffered the pain of it in our lives. You know, we see it in culture. All it takes is a promise and a party. I mean, you stand at the altar, you say your vows, I do, I do, and you have this massive party, and then that's it. That's it. I mean, think about it. Our culture, if you want to be an architect or a chef or a doctor or even a minister of religion, a pastor or church leader, you got to go to college. you got to get an education. You spend years learning and shadowing other experienced professionals to understand what it means to be in that profession. Isn't it amazing that in every part of our culture, there's school and training but there's almost no schooling and no training for relationships or for marriage. This is why if you're considering getting married or hope to be married one day, our church does a pre-marriage course. It's not some three-year degree. Maybe it could or should be. I don't know. That's up to you to decide. But it's a couple of weeks. And, and I'm adamant that couples who want to get married in our church go through it. Why? Because at least it gives them a foundation. It gives them a fighting chance to start off their relationship healthy and strong, dealing with stuff before they make the promise and before the party. But our culture falls into this trap of thinking all it takes is a promise and a party. But the truth is, promises, come on, you know this, are no substitute for preparation. Ask any um, winning coach, ask, ask any uh, coach of, of, of any team, whether it's a, a national rugby team or a, a local GEA team or soccer team. Prom- I mean, you know, you know, a coach won't say to his team, hey, you know what? Let, let, let's cancel practice this week. Let's go into the dressing room and we'll just promise to each other we're going to win. That's all we need. We just keep promising. I mean, no coach is going to do that. Why? Because they understand that promises are no substitute for preparation. If a coach has to sacrifice the five-minute pep talk to do five more minutes of drills in order to make themselves more prepared, they will choose preparation every time. Why? Because you don't promise to win games. You prepare to win. And this is not only true of sport. This is true of business. Come on, you business people who I'm talking to right now, business leaders, those of you who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs, creators, innovators. One of the things you learn about innovators and creators and entrepreneurs is very often they're the most hardest working people in a particular sector. Why? Because they understand it's not good enough to have the best idea. You've got to be willing to put the, the, the best amount of work in with that good idea to make something work. It's also true of academia. Even though many of you now have been let off the hook with your exams, I want to encourage you, I want to speak to you right now, to our teenagers, junior cert, leaving cert students, don't allow yourself off the hook. Yeah, okay, the very real pressure of impending exams is coming, but don't fall back and usurp your future. Don't fall back and fall into the trap of of giving over your best energy to your PlayStation, your Xbox. That's okay. But get in control of yourself. Why? Because if you want to win at life, if you want to see the dream, the extraordinary purpose that God has put in your heart come to pass, if you want him to answer the prayers you're praying about your future, you got to make sure you're doing all you can do so he has something to work with so he can do all he can do. He can't bless your exams if you're not prepared, okay? So it's not just true of sport, not just true of business, but it's also true of academia. You can't, it's not enough to promise yourself, I can do it. You got to prepare yourself. Why? Because here's what we see as true in culture. Saying I do does not mean I can. Saying I do does not mean 
I can. I mean, come on, you've been at weddings, like I've been at weddings, and you've watched the couple at the front, and <clears throat> they're saying their vows, and they've quoted songs, and they've handwritten them, and they're lovely, and they're flowery, and you've stood at the back, and you thought, this is never going. I mean, I know these people. I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Why? Because we both know it to be true. That simply saying, I promise or I do, does not mean all of a sudden you can. Marriage is about a lot more than just a, a promise and a party. It's about so much more. Saying I do, in other words, does not make you more capable. It does make you more accountable. Because in that vow, in those vows, are promises that you're able to make to each other. And if you haven't put the foundation in place to for those for those vows to stand upon, what you, what you won't what you won't have is more capability. What you will have is more accountability. And when you're cap when you're accountable, but not capable, here we go. You're gonna end up miserable. When you're accountable but not capable, that's when you're gonna find yourself living in misery. Why? Because you're not ready for this. And a simple way of saying it and again. It's going to blow your mind. This is actually going to blow your mind, the level of revelation you're about to receive. But basically, let me put it this way. If you aren't preparing, you won't be prepared. If you aren't preparing, you won't be prepared. This is why. This is so important. This is exactly what I feel, uh, what God wants to speak into. So if you're watching right now and you're a Christ follower and this is touching you in some way, personally, as you think about your relationship, God wants to speak to you. If you're watching right now and you're not a Christ follower, we're so glad that you're here too, along for the ride. Hopefully something I said today will encourage and inspire you. But wherever we are on the faith spectrum, this is what God wants to speak into. And this is why for me as a pastor, why following Jesus is worthwhile. I say following Jesus because you can be a Christian. You can be someone who is raised in a Christian family, who maybe even made a profession of faith, maybe even was baptized, but you're not following him. Okay, you're moving in a direction, but not moving in the direction he's moving in. Okay, I want to challenge all of us today that, that following Jesus is worthwhile for many reasons, but following Jesus when it comes to relationships is the best reason. I believe the best relationships in the world come as a result of following Jesus. Why? Because here's the underlying premise, and here's today's main point early on in the message. Jesus not only makes our lives better, by giving our life to him, surrendering ourselves to him, not only do we become more generous, more forgiving, more patient, not only does God transform our hearts, change our nature, change our character, set us free, release us from junk, give us a path and a direction in the future, but also <clears throat> Jesus, by the power of his Holy Spirit living in us, makes us better at life. Jesus makes our lives better but Jesus makes us better at life and you can swap out life and you can put in the word relationships. Why? Because not only will he help us find the right person, the right persons, I'm not sure there's exactly one person out there, but more importantly, he will help us to become the person. He will help us to become the person that can uphold those vows and really look back with joyful memories and think about the party. Why? Do you, so that we can become the kind of person you're looking for is looking for. Jesus can help us to become the kind of person you're looking for is looking for. So the question I ask right now to you today, as you think about your relationship, if you're someone who's moving towards, if you're someone who's engaged, you're someone who's in a, in a relationship or wanting a relationship, are you the person, the person you're looking for is looking for? Rather than looking outwardly saying, where is the person? Are you looking inwardly and asking yourself the question, am I the person that I'm looking for is looking for? And if you're married, let me kind of shift the question but apply it to you too. Are you still the person they were looking for? Have you committed yourself to upholding those vows and those commitments and, and the base for your relationship? Are you still the person they were looking for. You see, when Jesus steps onto the pages of history, when Jesus begins earthly ministry, you know, as we saw in the whole series that we just finished in the Gospel of John, it was ultimately to reveal to the world that he is the Savior. He is the Son of God. He is the high life. But part of, of, of receiving this life and following him is understanding that he came to change not just us, but to change the world which we live in. And part of that transformation was he gave us a new relational paradigm 
one that flies in the face of the culture. It runs counterculturally to the world that we live in. And on one hand, it was simple and it was compelling. But on the other hand, it was demanding and rewarding. And in this tension of simple but rewarding, compelling but demanding, is what we believe is true, truly healthy, vibrant relationship that's not only worth living for, but very often is worth dying for. And kind of continue kind of in the vein of John, I want to start this this week's kind of text. I'll give you a few thoughts. We won't spend too much time as the series unpacks. I'll get into scripture more. But just want to look one more time in John's gospel and chapter 15. And I'm going to read a couple of verses. Jesus speaking to his first century audience. Don't forget where they were. Middle East, Mediterranean style climate, uh, first century, mostly farmers and fishermen. And so whenever Jesus would communicate to, to his disciples, he would always use illustrations or parables that uh, they could understand the metaphorical meaning behind the images. But ultimately, these parables always led to an application. Sometimes it was to the crowd. Sometimes it was to religious leaders. And sometimes it was just to his disciples. Here in John 15, Jesus is coming to the end of his earthly ministry, the end of his time on earth. He's pulling his disciples real close. close. He's giving them kind of like the, the marching orders, the last pep talk. Like kind of, these are the most important things you guys should know before I leave. Kind of like when someone who we care about is dying and the... Um, They want to share their last word with us. And so in verse one, he begins with the metaphor of a vineyard, of a vine, a branch, fruit, and a gardener. And he says this, he says, I am the true vine. In other words, continuing with John, I am the source of life, okay? I am the source of life. And my father, he says, is the gardener. Okay, so this is the image. I'm the vine, okay? And my father is the gardener. Okay, verse two, it says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so it'll be even more fruitful. So Jesus, the vine, again, this is a bit alien for us living in Ireland, um, but to the first century listeners, this made perfect sense. Jesus is is the vine, and from the vine come these branches. The father is the gardener, and what the father is looking for essentially is fruit, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And what the father does is he tends the vine, takes care of the vine, and where branches aren't bearing fruit, he cuts them off to make, make room for fruit. Verse three, he says, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Okay, verse four then. Then Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So Jesus kind of shifts gears and says, here's the key. He says, if you remain in me, that word remain literally means to live, live with. It's not like a a sit down, have a chat with or pop in for a cup of tea. It's like to to put down roots and make your foundation. Like this this is my, this is my land. This is my spot. Think about uh, that terrible movie, Far and Away, when um, Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, um, are, are trying to you know get their land and the, this moment where he's on the horse and he sticks his stake in the ground. This is my land. Jesus said, "Hey, stick your stake in, in in this in this piece of ground. Live, remain, abide in me, and I will live and abide and remain in you." Why? Because no fruit, no 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 branch can bear fruit without it's it, it's itself being connected to me. Neither he says can we bear fruit as you made me. And the whole point of what Jesus is saying essentially is that it's not enough to be close to me, we need to be connected to him. It's not enough to admire him or like him. If we want to experience the the blessing and the benefits of our relationship with God, it's not enough to be close to him. We need to be connected to him. It's not enough to admire him. We need to abide in him. It's not enough to, to salute him. We need to surrender ourselves to him. Jesus says in verse five, I am the true vine and you, You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse six, he says, if you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown to the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse eight, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit. What's God's desire for us? That we bear much fruit. We're going to talk about fruit in a second. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. In other words, when we, when we bear fruit, we show ourselves to be Jesus' disciples. Okay, we're eight verses in. The burning question is, Jesus, 
what is this fruit? Well, Jesus again shifts gear and he begins to define what this fruit is. Verse nine, as the father has loved me, so I, or so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Jesus defines the fruit as love. The fruit that we produce by being not just close to, but connected to Jesus is the fruit of love. And it's not just any kind of love. It's a very radical, a very specific kind of love. As the father, Jesus says, loved me, so I uh, love you. What we see is this, just as the father demonstrated and expressed his love to Jesus, so Jesus has demonstrated and expressed this love to you. Now at this point in time in John's gospel, I mean, Jesus has been generous, he's been patient, he's done miracles, he's loved his disciples. But what was going to happen next as Jesus willingly went to the cross to be crucified and was buried and then rose again, completely rev revolutionized and transformed these early disciples' understanding of what love looked like. It's one thing to serve someone some food and say, I love you. It's one thing to kiss them on the cheek and say, I love you. It's another thing completely to be willing to die for a crime you never committed in order to save the person you love. Jesus is saying, if you remain in me, you will be connected to me. If you submit yourself, if you surrender yourself, if you trust me, if you allow me in, then you will remain and we will be connected. Verse 10, and what will happen as a result is that we will keep his commands. And as we keep his commands, we will remain in his love. And again, maybe you're watching thinking, oh, here we go, commands, church, religion, oh, this, this, this guy's going to start reciting the Ten Commandments. No, 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 track with me. He says, just as I have kept my father's commands and, and remain in his love, I have told you this so that your joy may be complete, basically. And so Jesus said, there's a part of where when we grasp this, our joy will be complete. And then Jesus in verse 12 brings this whole thing to its kind of cataclysmic conclusion. He says this, my command. So we're thinking, oh no, commands, here we go. Rules and regulations and religion and Old Testament. And Jesus going, no, no. My commands are actually one singular command. You want to bear the fruit of love? You want your joy to be complete? You want to be connected to the Father? You want to see a life-giving, transforming, growing, healthy, vibrant, long-lasting relationship? Then here's my command. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Love each other as I have loved you. And again, we're going to unpack this over the next couple weeks. But as we kind of bring this message to a close today, love each other as I have loved you. This isn't just become more loving. Jesus isn't saying, just be nicer. Just, just play nice, kids. Jesus isn't saying, just be more polite. This is a very specific, a very focused kind of love. This is a very different kind or brand of love. This is a brand of love that is unique to Jesus. Literally, Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you should love others. The predicate is you can't sow you unless as I. We can't give away what we have not experienced ourselves. You can't give that husband, that wife, that child, that mother, that father, that brother, that sister, sister or the world. You cannot give a love that you have not experienced yourself. If you want to give that love, if you want to have a relationship that is punctuated and characterized by that love, then we ourselves must receive it first. And maybe you're a Christ follower and you received at a point in time. Let me encourage you continually receive it. Maybe you're not a Christ follower. You've never experienced, you've been close to Jesus, but never really connected to him. Maybe today is a day where you make a decision. Say, you know what, God? I want to give you my life. And I want to experience this love in my heart for myself. Jesus brings a, a radical, foundational, fundamentally different perspective on love. As I have loved you, so you should. So you must, so you ought to. The natural progression or response to experiencing this love is that you will love one another. Again, this is massive. This is huge. This is transformation. This is why, like I said earlier on, this is why I think following Jesus is worthwhile. Why? Because Jesus makes our lives better. Having his love, knowing his love, experiencing his love changes our lives. It transformed my life and has changed so many of the lives of those you're watching right now. And it can continue to change your life if only you allow it. But also, Jesus makes us better at life. Why? Because let's be honest, guys, 
not any, not one of us, none of us have ever been accused of being too loving, right? None of us have been accused of being too like Jesus. And the truth is that so much good can come out of our relationships. The ones that are, the ones that, that uh, will be, if we can move in to experience more of Jesus' love and be able to share that with other people. Jesus makes our lives better, but Jesus makes us better at life. It's why one of the early church uh, fathers, one of the early church theologians, a guy called St. Augustine of Hippo, he was a theologian, a scholar uh, in ancient Egypt. He said, he basically summarized the gospel this way. He said, love and do what thou wilt. In other words, to put it in common language, love and do whatever you want. Once the foundation for everything that we do is love, and I mean real love, not, not our culture's perspective of love, but biblical Jesus love. Once we love, then very often everything that flows out of that will be good and positive. And rather than hurting me and hurting others, it will help me and help others. This is how you prepare. This is how you stay prepared. This is how you become a person worth looking for. But speaking to the married people right now, this is how you become a person worth staying for. The kind of person Jesus leads his followers to become is the kind of person we are ultimately looking for and ultimately want to become. In other words, the kind of person Jesus calls us to be is the kind of person we're looking to be with. If we can focus on being the kind of person we want to be with, by trying to make the person or find the person, very often that is the key to finding not the right person out there, but finding the right person here. Next week, we'll kind of build off of this and talk about the fine print of what it means to be in these relationships. So make sure you stay tuned and connect with us next week. Bye.